will take you into a little journey of how um, a designer can become um, a designer who works with food. Because um, this is something which is happening in the last 10 years and uh, I think uh, it's quite an exciting start of something new that's actually happening right now. So uh, there we go. Um, hello. Um, so I started to be educated as a product designer um, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands where I'm from uh, at the Design Academy. Uh, so there you are, as a young person, trying to find your perfect material, because that's what you do at a design school. You start to go to the wood workshop, do things with wood, you start to try metal, you start to try uh, plastics and textiles and, well, anything you want to try and see what fits you and what makes you feel you want to create something with. So every day I went to all these workshops and then um, after my classes I went home to make dinner. And then I was in my kitchen and um, I opened my cupboard, uh, 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 my cupboards, and then I, I had all my food stock there and then I thought, well, that's, that's material. And then if you're in your kitchen, then you have all your kitchen tools and, uh, and that's a little workshop. So then you start to, to do things with food and you think, ah, this is a kind of material I can use. So then you, you think, ah, this, this fits me, this fits my personal being. So then people tell you that you are a designer and you work with food and then you're a food designer. And it kind of makes sense because, um, yeah, that's how it, it also sounds nice, food designer. Uh, but it also would imply that I would actually design food, whereas I think food is already perfectly designed by nature. I don't need to design anything about, let's say, your beautiful sweet pepper. You know, it's fantastic. I'm not a god. But what I am much more interested in is to look at the verb of eating. And if you start to design from the verb of eating, you also work on harvesting food, on cooking food, on sharing food, on transporting food all over the world. Then you get involved with rituals, you get involved with culture, you get involved with science, you get involved with everything that happens in the body. Actually, I could say I'm designing shit, because everything I make, will eventually turn into shit. And I'm really happy about that. So I do eating design, and this is not a chronological story, but I'm going to share with you my first project because um, I found out it has a kind of Indian influence into it. Um, when I was a student at school, I got the assignment to do something with the color white. And um, as in many cultures, um, the color of white is the color of death, it is here. Um, but it's not in the Netherlands. We have black as our uh, uh, funeral color. So when we go to a funeral, we wear black and we go there and then we feel very sad and we have a sad face on and maybe we get a slice of sponge cake and a cup of coffee and that's it and then we leave. So we have very poor rituals when it comes to funerals and many other things, but I'm not going to talk to that, uh, about that right now. Um, but I looked around the world and I saw many inspiration in many other cultures and I saw that food and the whole process of mourning or burying uh, is very much connected in very many different cultures and that really made me feel inspired and also I understand that because food is also um, has comforting qualities. Food can comfort you, it can make you feel secure, it can make you feel better if you feel sad. So incorporating food in the burial process for me made a lot of sense. So um, what I did is uh, for all these sad Dutch people that don't have any rituals around death, uh, I made this um, dinner from only white ingredients. So it's naturally white ingredients and you have to know I'm not a chef, I'm not a trained chef, I don't cook professionally. Uh, I do like food and I like eating and I like experimenting with it, um, but I, just went to collect lots of white food and I, I prepared it in a very simple way and I put it all together on the table and it has a very serene feeling if you see it, if you, if you really encounter this full table of white food. And also white tastes and flavors, they combine very well together. Most of the white food is very subtle, so you can't really, it's not very distinct, but then some, that, uh, some white flavors are very sharp or very edgy, like garlic or horseradish or daikon root. And so these kind of bitter, edgy and 
neutral flavors together and make it very suitable, I think, for a, for a funeral. So these are just some different ways of presenting the same uh, idea. Um, so that was my first project, and I, I did many things. I, I'm doing this now for um, um, 13 years already. And uh, I have had two restaurants in the meanwhile for seven years. And um, the idea about restaurant was that I had a design studio where I could do my designs. And also, I would have a restaurant in the same space. So then all the people that would come to my restaurant would be my guinea pigs. Um, and it, it, it sounded really good and really interesting, and I also learned a lot from it. But it's also very hard to combine these two things together. But the restaurant was called proof, which means tasting, but it also means testing. It has a double meaning, and uh, the whole notion of proof was a big test for me, and it taught me lots of things. Um, so this was the logo of proof. And um, when I started my first one, which was in Rotterdam, um, I was very excited. I was 26. Um, I was uh, pregnant like this. Uh, uh, one month later, I actually delivered my daughter. And uh, we decided to have a very exciting opening. And I invited all my friends and people I knew would be interested. And I um, told them to be there for during the whole day. So when they entered, they had to tell me their uh, date of birth, their birthday. And when you know one's birthday in Western astrology, you also know one's zodiac sign. And when you know one's zodiac sign, you also know their element. And in Western astrology, we have water, fire, air, and earth. So we could divide everybody into these four elements. But we didn't tell them that. They only got a ribbon around their wrist in a certain color with a herb onto it. And so they were seated down at the table, and some people got earth food, some people got air food, water food, fire food. Um, this person has air food, so all the food was um, earthy flavored, growing underneath the ground, kind of autumn kind of flavors and colors. And um, these two people are fire people. Later on, I found out that this guy is actually a fireman, which I thought was quite nice. Um, and their food is red, it's flamed grilled, it's spicy, it's, it's everything that you think of when it comes to fire food. And um, what happened here was kind, kind of funny. Um, the, so we did this, and the first two hours, because you don't know how many people that you have um, invited will be of a certain kind of element. So we bought in food of every element in equal amounts. And the first two hours, only the earth people and the... Uh, uh, air people came in. So we gave out all this earth and air food. And I got re really scared because I thought, wow, we're going to end up with lots of this other food and we're going to run out of this kind of food. And then after two hours, the water people and the fire people came. And um, later on, I read in my big book of astrology that uh, water and fire people have the tendency to be late. It's in their <laughs> astrological character, which is very much non-scientific, but kind of a nice story. Um, this is what I always think of with a pop-up restaurant. Um, so I started all these kind of different projects, and every year since the beginning, people have been asking me to make a Christmas dinner. And because in Europe, especially, Christmas is the biggest thing. And I always refused to do it because I thought, you know, what can you design about a Christmas dinner? Christmas is full of decoration, of um, typical dishes. It's, it's, it's over, overdone. What, what can a designer do with that? But then Renny, who spoke yesterday from Droog Design, she asked me to do a Christmas dinner, and uh, she persuaded me to do it. And then I thought, well, what is Christmas really about? And if you look at the essence of it, it's really about being together and sharing together next to the, the story of Jesus Christ. And if you, if, you look, if you look at it that way, then it's actually really simple. So I made a very simple intervention. I took a table with a tablecloth, and instead of letting the tablecloth hang down, which it normally does, I took it up into the air and made some slits in it. So these are some sketches that um, I sent to Renny, and she said, okay, let's do that. And this was the whole setting. And this was in Amsterdam, and we invited 40 people that didn't know each other. And um, I was very scared to do this, because I was really, 
um, thinking nobody would want to participate in this. Uh, but everybody did. So then we had 40 heads and f uh, 80 hands. And uh, the reason for doing this has, um, is multi-purpose because um, first of all, you're physically connected. Because if I pull here, you can feel it there. You're really moving into this big kind of moving piece of interior kind of thing. Um, secondly, um, it's a kind of communist idea that everybody gets equal once you don't see your identity through your clothes anymore. Everybody is just a head with hands, and that's, that's what you are. So in that sense, um, it also makes a connection between people. And finally, um, if you put everybody in a strange situation, that's what also team builders do, um, people start to connect to each other. Um, this is when you see the backs, which maybe is even nicer. Um, thank you. Um, I did this uh, in Tokyo, in Japan, um, and here I was even more scared. Again, 40 people that didn't know each other. And when they arrived, they were behaving very formal, handing over the business cards and, and not smiling too much. And I was, I was really scared. But what I saw there, and what really intrigued me, was that once they got into this tablecloth, it was as if their masks were falling off, as if they were dropping their, their faces, and they became very playful and very interactive, like children. And this was really a big change in behavior that happened there that, uh, that I encountered, and that you can see that, pe that people start to uh, become playful with it. Well, it's not only the setting, it's really also the food. So what you can see here um, is a girl uh, with just melon, so, you know, food design, it's just melon, you know, it's nice melon, nothing special. Uh, but you can see that her plate is cut in two. She has two half plates. Everybody on her side of the table has the same dish, just melon on two half plates. Everybody on the upper side of the table has ham. Well, ham and melon um, in Italian cuisine, uh, which is kind of international, is a classical, classical dish together. You don't have to tell people what to do. People will start to share their plate and they will start to interact with each other and to make eventually their uh, first course. Well, the second course was in the same idea. The first person would get a huge piece of, of rib. The sex, second person would get a huge um, lettuce, like a complete lettuce. It would be cleaned, but it would be having croutons and dressing and everything on top. The third person would get a complete pumpkin stuffed with seeds and nuts and everything, and the last person would get potatoes. So people are social animals. They like to share. You don't have to tell them what to do. They will start to cut up their food, and they will start to share and interact and be playful with each other and make a lot of mess, which is always a good, good sign for me. I don't want to lock people up in my design, so one of the parts of the cutlery was scissors, so people could cut themselves free and eventually be released of the whole setting, because I don't want it to uh, restrain them from feeling free. Um, so I got a bit into doing Christmas dinners, and one year after I did another one for Droog again. Uh, and it had the same idea about being connected to each other, but now in a different way. So what you can see here is the setup of uh, the dinner. So um, on the table, on top of the table itself, you can see a pink dot, which is a kind of sugar dough. And on top of there, there are bowls. And on top of these bowls, there will be a tablecloth, but the tablecloth will be made out of pizza dough. So that will be the tablecloth. And then we have these lamps. And these lamps, they are 100 watt electrical bulbs, and they are quite hot. So we placed them on top of the table, facing the tablecloth and making it warm for one night. So eventually the dough will cook and be hard. And this is the start of the dinner. The last, uh, on the right hand side, you can see how it looks before the dinner starts. And then we were serving very hot and soggy things on top of the bowls, on top of the tablecloth, like stew and curries and soup. So to make it hot again and to uh, make the dough soft so you can eat it together with your food. And then after the main course, we took away the bowl and then you can see on the left hand side, there's the surprise layer of pink sugar dough on top of which we uh, serve dessert. So you're actually eating the tablecloth together with your food. Another pop-up restaurant. They pop up everywhere. So. Um, 
I get most of my inspiration just from really simple things. I really like daily life, I really like supermarkets, these kind of simple things. And um, in um, the Western world, there is this big um, innovation going on right now on making um, vegetarian alternatives. And as you probably know, in Northern Europe, we are eating lots of meat, but more and more people are getting vegetarian right now. But um, industry is, is trying to help them uh, to make copies of real meat. So in our, in our supermarkets, you can find vegetarian bowls, vegetarian uh, burgers, vegetarian sausages, vegetarian fillets, vegetarian schnitzels, vegetarian whatever you want, you know, it's, it's just a copy of, of real meat made from soy protein or any kind of other protein. And I'm really intrigued because if you don't want to eat meat, then I'm not really understanding why you have to literally copy the meat. And also, if you don't have intestines, like in an animal you have intestines, so you make a sausage, but you don't have them, so why do you want to make a, a vegetarian sausage? So I'm just not getting it completely. And I was also thinking, you know, if you have this protein, if you have this protein structure that you can make in any shape, why don't you just invent new animals? So what you see here is the herbast. And this is an animal, it's like this big, and it lives in the herbal fields of Albania, where it runs through the fields. And it has to be careful, and it has to be camouflaged for predators. And in order to be camouflaged, it has a fur made of herbs. And so the stir-fry chops that you can just buy like that are already pre-seasoned because it has a coat of fur. Also, this animal is square-shaped, which is really convenient for packaging, transport, <laughs> and also at the table, everybody gets an equal share. Then there is the ponty. The ponty is a small rodent-like animal, and it lives in empty volcanoes where it nibbles on the ashes of the volcanoes. And because it nibbles on the ashes, the meat of this animal is slightly delicately smoked. And it's also a perfect party snack because it has a firm tail and it has to make burrows in these hard magma layers in the volcanoes. And so it has a very firm tail and you can just pick it up by the tail and keep your hands clean. So this is the ponty. And then there's the bikyo. This is a vegetarian fish and it lives in the shallow waters of Japan where it feeds itself on the seaweed that grows there. And every connoisseur knows that the green stripes in the meat of the bikyo show that this huge amount of seaweed also makes the bikyo to have uh, a high level of antioxidants. And also it's aesthetically very attractive for sushi and sashimi and this kind of uh, waste of preparation. So this is how you can see it in the supermarket. And this is a vegetarian um, bird, and um, this bird is um, a dessert meat because it lives in the maple trees of Canada and it feeds itself on the sap of the trees. So the meat is very tender and sweet. So it combines very well with chocolate or ice cream um, as a des dessert. So this is the making of the meat. Uh, what you saw here were prototypes. We made them from marzipan, because in Holland we have a tradition uh, of making marzipan animals around December. Um, but I'm actually working now with, uh, with a producer of vegetarian uh, protein, uh, and we did make the ponty uh, for an opening of an exhibition I curated. And some vegetarians didn't want to eat it because it looked too much like real meat. And then other people told me later that they were Googling uh, the ponty because they thought it was a real animal, <laughs> which was really nice to hear. Um, yeah, seedless bananas are designed by humans. The, you, and anyway, bananas are a human design. Uh, they're not natural. You, they, they don't grow like that. They never did in nature. Um, and it's funny to think of that all the food that we eat, um, most of the food we eat, and also the things you consider natural, like fruits and vegetables, um, are many times uh, being interfered by, by humans. Once we started to do agriculture, we started to be food designers in a way. And I think many people's, uh, people are not aware of where our food comes from, especially now since globalization is happening in the world and we just can fly in and out anything we want. 
Um, so what you see here is part of a bigger project um, uh, called the Go Slow Cafe, which we, I did with Droch again, um, which is a, a dinner, uh, well, like a wooden board which serves your dinner on to, and it has circles engraved on it. And every circle goes from small to big, uh, big to smaller and smaller, uh, shows where your food comes from on that venue. So the first circle is the biggest, and it has all the food that comes from in a circle of five miles around that venue. And the second circle is smaller a little bit, and it shows all the food that is served on your board that comes from 100 miles around your venue. And so it goes on and on until you get into the, the other side of the world, and eventually we have some moon dust uh, on this. Um, on this board. And I don't want to tell people it's wrong to get food from the other side of the world because we are cur curious human beings. But I do want to show that it came from somewhere and that people can be a bit more aware of where it came from. So this is kind of the same idea. This is just like a painting tray that you normally use to um, mix your paint colors with. Uh, but I was serving melon and ham again. And um, the melon came from different places, and so did the ham. And uh, I'm not telling you that it's better to, to take it from here or from there, but I was adding little notes underneath the ham to show um, the, where it came from, and you can make your own decision which taste you like best. Um, so these are some marshmallow clouds. Uh, they are made with uh, real rainwater as one of the ingredients. We have lots of that in Holland, uh, so that's easy. Uh, we have marshmallow icebergs, marshmallows that melt in your hot chocolate and give you inner global warming. <laughs> um, sugar spoons, you can just stir them in your hot tea and then they dissolve and you don't have any dishes to do. Um, a sugar gun is a lollipop and it shows what sugar does to your body. Although this is really quite disturbing if you see children uh, running around with that. Um, this project was actually just an illustration for a book, but they really liked it in Japan, so they, uh, they started to produce it. Um, it's called Grandma's Toothless Candy Box. And I was thinking that if you have fake teeth, that it's really annoying that you can't eat um, everything that you want, especially candies or sweets. So uh, this is a box with lots of kind of different kind of sweets that you can eat if you take your teeth out. So as grandchildren, you can make this for your grandparents and then they can take their teeth out and then they can enjoy this kind of sweets. Um, this is a small project, but it's very dear to me. And I did this project in Rotterdam, and I did it for the Historical Museum in Rotterdam, and they had an exhibition about the Second World War. And you have to know that Rotterdam, at the end of the Second World War, has been in a hunger winter. Many people died of starvation uh, in this winter, and it was a very hard time. There was just no food to be found, and the city was bombed. So it was just a big mess and a crater. And this museum in Rotterdam uh, made this exhibition about that time and they asked me to do something uh, in addition to that. So I went to the Resistance Museum and I asked them for some original war recipes, handwritten recipes from that time with the scarce food that they did have. And what I did is I just prepared these recipes. I didn't design anything about, this, about the ingredients. I just made them. But I made them into very small snacks and I served them onto cardboard sheets. And whenever people entered um, the exhibition, they got a coupon, like you got coupons in the war. And with the coupon, they got a cup of surrogate coffee and a cardboard sheet as a ranchion with um, some of the bites of the food that they, uh, that they had in that time. And what happened there is that some people were there that were children during the time of war. And they didn't have this food in their mouth for over 65 years. And once they ate the food and they tasted the flavors that maybe their mothers or their grandmothers had made for them during that time, they had memories of that time that they were children in the war. And I never expected that to happen because I didn't think of it. 
But it happened, and it was beautiful because it was a part of their life that they thought they were forgotten about. And it was there, and they could feel it. And as a designer, to work with any material, I'm really thrilled that I found this material that can be absorbed by your body, can be a part of your body, but can also be a part of your emotions and your brain. And that makes me very grateful to work with that. Well, I want to show you my daughter. Her name is Juni, which means June in Dutch. And she's really cute. Uh, you can see her here. She was just like three years old. Uh, she's eight now, so she's much older and much wiser. But back then, she was super, super cute, but she didn't want to eat her vegetables. And that is really bad marketing for me. So I needed to do something. Um, and I read somewhere in the psychological research that children need to taste something seven times before they will accept a flavor. So you just have to repeat and repeat and repeat. It's not only children. You know, adults can, can use that way too, also to teach yourself to, 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 to accept a new flavor and to understand it. Um, so that was one thing that I, that I read about. And the other thing was that I noticed that once you put a child into the situation at the dining table, many of them, they already start to resist because a child doesn't have too much to say about its life, but it can decide if he or she wants to open their mouths or not. So that's a kind of thing. And um, so some of them already start to decide they are at the war zone at the table and just shut their mouths and be very happy of all the attention then, that they get. Um, so I thought I have to do something with that and I um, decided I want to do a workshop with all the kids from her daycare, from my daughter's daycare. So I invited them and I told the kids we're going to do a workshop and it, we, it will be a jewelry making workshop and I called it veggie bling bling for the boys workshop. And um, I told them, because they were sitting at a long table full of vegetables laying there, that we were going to play and we were going to make jewelry. And the tools that they could use to do that were their teeth, because children's teeth are really, really sharp. And also it was a game, so you, when you were using your teeth, you could also win this kind of contest of making the best uh, jewelry. And, um, but they, we also had some um, drilling machines you should try that combination of drilling machines and vegetables, really nice, uh, to make some um, other kinds of um, rings and stuff. Um, but what I saw was that um, we were not in the situation of uh, dining, we were in the situation of playing. So they started to nibble away, and uh, some of them, I saw them eating their ring, and eventually the ring was gone because they forgot that they were playing and just started to eat it. <laughs> So I can proudly say that Uni uh, eats her vegetable. I just, I just want to finish off with one more project and then it's gone. Uh, this is a project I did in Hungary. And you have to know that in Hungary, um, gypsies are being regarded as very low. They are being rejected by society and they are really not being accepted. And this is what you need to know before watching this film. Feeding is a very intimate, a mother feeds her child, 
with food but also with love at the same time. Um, I thought about making this installation where uh, people are getting physically fed with food but also with stories. <laughs> The installation is made in a way that you can't see each other. You're sitting under the table, you have this little tent, inside there are pictures and text and a flashlight and it's a kind of strange environment. And then you sit there and the lady tells you her memories and the memories of the food that she has and she will include you in her life in that way. És volt egy ember, akivel folyamatosan együtt mentünk házra a házra, aki a intézetből intézett, hogy nem tudom, hogy mondjam neked. Ő szörke volt. És akkor ő azt kérdezik, hogy azt kérdezik. És akkor itt valami kellett mennünk vele, kimentünk hozzá, és egész nap takarítani kellett, hogy itt a vendégek. És betettek minket egy ilyen hideg szobába, de nagyon különösek voltak. Vissza is vittek, hogy hideg fel. És az nagyon gyönyör volt, az nagyon szép, nagyon szép. If you've had that experience and someone shared her food with you and her story with you, you cannot hate that person. You have to like that person. It's Emmanuel Kant that said that if you break bread with each other, you can't break each other's neck. Most is az egy jó, akkor odalépett hozzám az Ágnes, 